Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prosperity Through Multifamily Real Estate Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Cody Laughlin, and joining me uh, yet again, Mr. John Beatty. John, what's up, buddy? How's it going? Glad to be here. It's a great, cool Saturday in Houston, Texas. It sure is, man. It's a gorgeous day outside and a uh, great day to be networking and having a great podcast interview with our special guest, which John, tell us who that is today. All right. We got Ben Day with us. I'm excited for this because I've got a lot of accounting questions. Ben's the owner of Lionshare Bookkeeping. Uh, they provide outsource, outsource bookkeeping and CFO services to real estate investors exclusively. Uh, he also has launched a CFO system in 2020 to help uh, real estate uh, investors and operators figure out their finance department. Uh, before they are, you know, committed to uh, an accounting nightmare. Uh, he's a certified instructor at bookkeepers.com and helps other aspiring entrepreneurs launch and grow their bookkeeping businesses. In addition to that, he also is founder of the Rex Capital Group that invests in various real estate projects. So, Ben, thanks for having us. Thanks for Dude. being on. I am so pumped to be here. Like I, anytime I get to open my mouth and talk about real estate with people who like get it, uh, it's, it's a hoot. Like it is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course, man. Of course, man. Love, love the fact that you're here with us today. And I know that we connected a while back and, and really enjoyed our conversation. So excited to dive into this topic. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, you know, it goes without saying as entrepreneurs, we know that we have to have a team of professional advisors around us, right. To help us grow our business. But What's interesting is the bookkeeping book aspect is probably one that you don't hear a lot about, but is very, very important and vital to our business. So uh, really excited about today's conversation. So, and, and I've mentioned this before on the show, and I love just pointing the fact out that, you know, you're also a professional, you're, you're, you know, you have your bookkeeping, your CFO services, but you're also an investor yourself. So you live kind of both hats and both worlds. And so, um, you know, always appreciate uh, that insight. Uh, in that uh, background. So, but uh, Ben, yeah, tell us a little bit about your background, kind of how you found yourself in bookkeeping and CFO services, and then uh, let's go from there. Sure. So I, I graduated from the University of Oklahoma in 2015, and I got two degrees while I was there. One was in accounting and the other one was in music. Uh, and I'm absolutely comfortable saying that the only reason I got the accounting degree was because that was how I was going to get help paying for college. Like I had zero desire to sit around and work on numbers and spreadsheets all day. I've, I've, I've got the gift. You but, just wanted to jam. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> just wants to jam, man. Come on. Um, and so, so I was having a good time. So like I got the degree, whatever, cool, two bachelor's degrees. I found a gig in the music industry, kind of running the business side of some different music projects. And that was really cool until Christmas Eve 2016 uh, when I got laid off from that gig for no reason other than, hey, we uh, ran out of money, so I can't pay you till we raise some more funds or sell some more tickets. Uh, sorry. And that was it. Right. And it's like, and no, no, like no hard feelings. It was just like, this is just the truth. And I was kind of caught in this situation of, I never want to be here again. Like I, like it was a job and I still like, like cash wasn't under control. I want to control my own cash. Let's be my own boss. Um, followed very quickly by, I feel like there are a lot of people that don't really understand their own cash. And that's a skill set that I have. And I, and I could talk about bookkeeping and accounting without sounding like an accountant or bookkeeper. Uh, let's leverage these skill sets. So I went and I found a coach, started line share bookkeeping, um, thought I was going to do bookkeeping for microbreweries. And just cause like at the time I was a bartender. Um, so I thought we were going to do some stuff like that. That never really took off. And then one day my dad effectively thumps me on the head and says, Ben, I'm a loan officer at a one branch community bank in Oklahoma city where most of what we do is fix and rent loans. And these home investors and fortune builders come in here every day, sharp as a tack, know how to build, know how to market, do not know how to put their numbers together. And we can't do business. If you wanted to be the bridge between the real estate investor and the bank, everybody can make way more money. Uh, and that, that happened in like June 17. And uh, today we're rocking and rolling. Today I've got employees in the country, out of the country. Uh, right now we've got 43 different real estate investing businesses on our roster that we talk to every month about their numbers and doing the accounting. We're pushing out 1099s right now. It's January. Um, and that's just what we do. And it's kind of just been nonstop ever since that one like crystallizing moment where I was like, use your network and help people make money and get paid to do that at the same time. And I'd like to remind our listeners, if you listen to this comment, he said, I got a coach. 
that seems to be a common theme on this show. Mm -hmm. I just, Mm -hmm. I love coaching. Like I, like I love coaching so much that when that bookkeeping coach came back to me and said, Hey, uh, you seem to have figured a little bit about this. Like, like you seem to know what's going on. Do you want to maybe help us out with some projects? I was all in. Uh, and that was, we had that conversation a year ago. I actually just got offered to speak at the, uh, bookkeeper X, the BKX conference in Vegas, uh, for bookkeeping professionals only. We've got like, uh, the guys from digital marketer are coming and speaking. Oh yeah, um, for sure. We've got that's, all that's kinds big of big then. Yeah. Like we got cool stuff and it all came from that initial coaching relationship where it was like, I have the degree. I still don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't know. I don't know how marketing works. Like, I don't like help me, like give me the gasoline so we can move. Uh, I'm a huge fan of coaching and then like turning around and giving back as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it goes without saying, man, you can't under, you can't put a value on the, on having a coach, uh, you know, in your corner that can help guide you along the way and just kind of help accelerate your business. You know, yeah, you can figure it out along the way, but you're probably going to make a lot of mistakes, sometimes expensive mistakes. And having that coach there can just kind of, you know, really propel you to the next level and, you know, help you avoid those mistakes, if you will. So, but uh, yeah, we're definitely big fans of that ourselves being part of a coaching program. And, um, you know, uh, you definitely have to have somebody like that on your team. But uh, nonetheless, man, Ben, let's kind of get into a little bit about, um, you know, how how you're assisting real estate investors like ourselves. Tell tell us Uh, what we're doing wrong. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So Tell us a story. <laughs> yeah. Like, I what, bet what is, you've got a few. Yeah. Talk to us about like some of the, what are the common mistakes that you're seeing out there in the world of real estate investors that, you know, when it relates to bookkeeping and accounting? Sure. So, and we could be here all day talking about the things that people do wrong. Let's get that just out of the way. Uh, and I'm not here to talk about like accelerated depreciation or debits and credits and journal entries. Like again, not a boring bookkeeper. What I like where we see most of the issues show up with real estate investors is that we've kind of, there's this culture, like the rich dad culture, right? Where it's like, like accountants don't know what real assets are. Assets put money in your pocket and like real estate investing can be simple and all of that stuff. And so we are thinking about all of these strategies for seller finance and cash flow and all these really powerful operational ideas. And then you have to turn around and put that in QuickBooks and the language just isn't there anymore. Like accounting is still a language at the end of the day. All the time we see people doing their business bookkeeping their business accounting, like it's their personal budget. And so like case in point, if you're going to the bank, you've got a big rehab, you've got a value add deal that you're working on, you get a big loan draw from the bank. If you're coding that into your account as income, like, hey, you put that money into your business, you're going to pay taxes on that loan draw. Nobody likes that. You don't have to do that. Like that's, that's blatantly wrong. Uh, But because we're like kind of skipping the accounting lessons in our pursuit of this real estate, there's stuff that just, we just find stuff all the time where it's been booked incorrectly. And sometimes it's easy to catch. And sometimes we'll see tax accountants say, oh, that's fine. You can leave that there because it'll all shake out in the end. We just have to do something different. And it puts all kinds of real estate investors on this roller coaster where their income is huge one year and gone the next. And it's just unpredictable. Personally, it looks sloppy when you're dealing with your LPs or your uh, private money. And so really fundamentally, like the biggest mistake that we see is treating your accounting like it's your budget. And it couldn't be farther from the truth. You got to have all those pieces in play. You got to have that basic level of financial literacy in the accounting space in order to get this done and get it done right. What, so are, are people just kind of mistranslating from accounting to, to bookkeeping? Is that, that's basically what you're saying? It, yeah. And that's basically where it starts oh. is, um, so one of the things that we'll tell clients is just tell me the story, right? I don't need you to be an accounting expert. Just tell me what you did. Hey, we got a loan draw for this thing. Perfect. I know exact like that is a, like a, like a credit on the holdback of the liability, yada, 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 whatever, whatever. Um, but we know where to put that. We just need the story. And what we find is that especially when people are doing it themselves, when they're starting out, they don't know what questions to ask. And when they're thinking about how is this transaction flowing, they're just putting it wherever they think it fits best without really knowing the accounting or the lending, like applications to this. So like I talked about loan draws, the other big thing that we see is CapEx, right? Everybody kind of knows what CapEx is. It's, it's not, you know, like cleaning. It's not like a make ready. It's like, Hey, we got to put in a new AC or a bunch of new air conditioning units or whatever. We got to fix a roof completely. 
that CapEx line item, which we'll see most of the time on like a budget for, for a value add deal, doesn't belong on your profit and loss at all at all. It's a repair and maintenance. It's like, it's on, it's on all the forms, but all of that stuff should be on your balance sheet as an asset instead of on your income statement as an expense. And that affects how your lending works. That affects how your taxes work. And you can use the tax law to get all that stuff to iron out in the end. But even just putting it in the wrong place communicates different things to these, to your other financial professionals that like it just sends the wrong message consistently. Uh, and you just aren't going to know that stuff unless you build, like I said, that kind of that foundational financial literacy and accounting, you're just going to continue to make mistakes like that. So Ben, you, you've kind of mentioned, you know, the differences, I guess, from like what an accountant would interpret as, you know, on the profit and loss versus what you guys would, what's the difference between the two, two roles here, you know, between a bookkeeper and accountant, like how are they segregated in their responsibilities and whatnot. Sure. And so this is super common. What we will f like the easiest way for some folks to begin to understand this is to think about like a nurse and a doctor. If you're going in for a checkup, right? You go to the doctor's office, you don't see the doctor at the front door. You don't even see the doctor till about 60% of the way through your visit. If, if even that, right. But there's always somebody there with you taking down all the information, asking you questions. They're probably sharp as attack and beginning to ask you even more probing and consistent questions, gathering a whole bunch of information and putting it on one to three sheets of paper, handing that off to the doctor. The doctor comes in and says, Hey, in my professional opinion, you've got X, Y, and Z see you later. You spend five minutes with them. If it's a, like a normal checkup and you're out the door, you spent so much time with that nurse who is gathering the information and putting together all the relevant details. And then a doctor comes in and can be not to like be tongue in cheek about this, but be very surgical with his <laughs> relationship with you where it's like, Hey, listen, uh, you're overweight. You need to stop smoking. Talk to you later. Like, or, or whatever it is, but it's the nurse that's gathering all that information and prepping it so that the doctor can do the same thing. Accountants and bookkeepers are very similar. Bookkeepers gathering that information, putting the reports together, making sure that it's all good to go. They're even highlighting questions for the accountant to go in and ask later or follow up on. And then the accountant can spend their time diving into the tax code whenever the tax code changes uh, or like you're a very specific situation. Let's say you're doing real estate and crypto or, or whatever it is that you have going on. They can go and do the time, do the research and have that skill set without having to spend all of their time collecting and, and formatting and building the reports on all of that data. That's like I said, easiest way to begin to try to draw these lines. Gotcha. Gotcha. How do you, how do you, uh, so when investors get started with this, um, what's the best way to help them like clean up their, are, are there system issues that, that you see with your clients a lot, you know, you know case in point, they've got, you know, 16 different papers that they hand you and they're like, what do I do with this? Drop a box on your desk. It's like, here you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's, what's the, what's the back end solution? Yeah. So every, every time it's either a box on my desk uh, effectively, or it's like, Hey, I've got a spreadsheet, uh, but it's a different spreadsheet per house or per deal. And none of them are formatted the same and they're all a little bit different, but it all makes sense to me. It should make sense to you. Right. Uh, that is pretty textbook for what we see on the, on, on how folks get started. Um, what we like to see people get to is one system in one place that they can use, they know is correct, scales with their business, and then they can just put a person in that role at some point, whether that's us or somebody else. And what, what, is that, what does that look like? Is that just kind of using QuickBooks the whole time for all your projects? And Yeah, so, and there's like... First, I think QuickBooks is the evil overlord, like, uh, but they they are the best in the game. So um, everybody kind of dogs on in, in the accounting community. Everybody's kind of dogging on QuickBooks. They're looking for things like Zero or Stessa is popular with real estate right now. You've got Cozy, Tenant Cloud, all of that stuff. That's all fine. At the end of the day, the ideal system for us is something that will scale in the like in the community that it's built around. So like, I don't need a real estate software to do my accounting. I, what I really need is an accounting software to do my accounting that's operated by somebody who understands the real estate. Uh, so a lot of the times, like I interview different like tech people that are building real estate, like property management platforms all the time. And consistently there's just stuff missing uh, that you need in your accounting space. I, I interviewed somebody the other day who didn't have a balance sheet on his accounting software. Like it just wasn't there. That's, that would work in almost any other industry, but it definitely doesn't work in real estate. Uh, 
so consistently what we like to see is a real accounting software. So we only use QuickBooks Online in my firm. Uh, and then if that software can connect to other things, whether it's a Zapier integration or something like that, where it's getting really like out there, or it's just like standard connections, like we connect QuickBooks to tenant cloud and to like uh, document management platforms to kind of streamline the process. Um, that sort of interconnectivity being in the cloud and being really accounting focused first is what we always look for in a uh, accounting solution for real estate investors. Yeah. You know, Ben, you kind of highlighted two important points there and I want to go back and, and, you know, we mentioned it at the beginning of the show here where, you know, again, this is where the power of you being both, you know, not only a professional yourself, but also an investor is so important, right? Because you can understand both worlds and we see that a lot. I mean, look, we love our accountants and they're so, they're great at analyzing data numbers and, and whatnot, but not all of them are real estate investors and not all of them understand this world. And so there is that that gap or disparity sometimes. So it, it's, it's such a powerful advantage when you have somebody like yourself who again has both worlds. So always appreciate that. But then the second thing you mentioned too, is in your systems and your, your business, the ability to integrate. And I think we've talked about this offline before is the ability to integrate across multiple platforms or, you know, with work with various property management teams to help us on our side is, um, and it's just such a big convenience uh, when you have that, uh, that luxury. Dude. So, uh, two years ago I was working with, I did like an odd job, like, cause everything we do is virtual. So I never, I never do office visits. Like I, it's, it's great sweatpants all day. I've been like pre-gaming this quarantine life since 2017, basically. Um, but, uh, two years ago, uh, there was an opportunity that came up where I could do an office visit, uh, and kind of fill in for a bookkeeper that was going on vacation. And so I go in and they're using some different systems, but I could just plug in because it's QuickBooks. And what I loved about that is that in the, in the actual office, they're dealing with hundreds of units. There is a property management office and an accounting office and they're right next to each other. But the tenants knew we're going to walk into the property manager's office, hand them a rent check, talk about the maintenance requests, talk about if like, we got to kick payments out or do something special. Let's figure that out. All of that is in one, like one room. And then once a week, once a day, whatever the rhythm is, that property manager brings their accounting reports to the accounting office and says, here's the rent that got paid. And can you help me figure out who hasn't paid rent yet so that we can make those late fee calls? And it's just as simple as like, don't expect your property managers to know how to do accounting. Like that's not their job. Their job is managing the tenants and building those relationships and, and being able to have those hard conversations and having the follow-up. Accountants don't like talking to people. Like don't, don't expect both skill sets to live in the same place. If you got it, that's awesome. But fundamentally it's like, let property managers do what property managers are best at. Let accountants do what accountants are best at in their own spaces and rooms and softwares and just make sure that they talk to each other. And then it's a big happy family and nobody's stepping on each other's stoves. You don't have to learn a whole bunch of stuff. It's it, fundamentally the best time I've ever had working in an office. Interesting. Let's go, let's go a little bit deeper into that, Ben, because I, I like that perspective. And, um, you know, you're absolutely right when, you know, letting each discipline, you know, focus on what they're good at and what their job is, you know, and keep it in their lane, if you will. But how do we like, let's say for the asset managers out there who may be managing the manager, working with the property managers, make sure the business plan is being executed, whatnot. How do we segregate that and how do we keep them on task, but also get keeping you guys, the bookkeepers involved and, and kind of keeping that cohesiveness amongst the disciplines at that, if you will. Oh, sure. So what I, and what I really love about asset managers, it, it really is kind of like a COO style role where it's like, like, we're just keeping everybody on task. We're hitting our deadlines. We're making sure that this, like the train keeps moving. Property managers are going to do what they're going to do. Accountants, money raisers, everybody's doing what they're best at. That is absolutely how you should run this every time. I, which is really why I love the syndication model. Uh, it's just easy to plug in, easy to understand. As far as keeping people in their best roles, we've seen property management firms that are huge, very like big teams, lots of units. They've got a full system in place and they can afford to hire a bookkeeper in every building and a controller and a tax advisor, and then kick those reports out. And then we've seen property management companies where it is like, like a handyman decided to marry a realtor and now they're a property management company and, and, and they're going to rule the world. And I, I love both of those things. We have clients that are like that. That's fantastic. 
but they still have skill sets. They still have places where they're really strong and uniquely qualified and places where they have like, they're just blind. Like that's just a blind spot to them. For us, it really is all about don't ask people to do more than they really know. Like, so pretty much everybody knows how to take a picture. So I don't feel bad at all about asking for receipts, right? But in no way, shape or form, am I going to go to the people that aren't that kind of data oriented and say, hey, would you put a spreadsheet together for me that does X, Y, and Z so I could see the data? Like, no, man, we got to go in there and get that data ourselves because it's going to slow them down. It's going to make them feel stressed. I'm going to pull them away from what they're best at. That's, that's just no good way to run a team. So if you're an asset manager and that's what you're trying to do, have the key people in your team figured out and go ahead and assess what their strengths and weaknesses are. Everybody says they're the bomb. Everybody says they're good at everything. Figure out where they come from, what their primary skill set is, and make sure they stay in that lane. And you can sometimes you can just ask them and they'll tell you. Sometimes you got to pigeonhole them yourself. You can use tests like uh, I really like Strengths Finders. You can use DISC. Uh, if you're an Enneagram person, you can use an Enneagram. Um, but like I just, I'm all about building the team comp in a way that makes the most sense. And it's all about finding that primary skill set and leaning on it. Focus on the core competencies. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's it. Hey, so uh, what's what's the uh, order of operations when you're working with a real estate entrepreneur? I mean, how do they start? Like, where do they start? And what's what's the small time look like? What's the big time look like in that journey up the uh, kind of the accounting and, and tax and kind of CFO journey? Oh, sure. So fundamentally, everybody's starting out doing it themselves. Like, you don't ignore it. You can't ignore it. You're going to open yourself to up to a whole lot of weaknesses if you ignore your own accounting. Um, so like right now we have some, we have over 20 uh, active leads in our, in our bookkeeping business right now, where we usually have two to three a month. And those 20 came in in the last two weeks. And that's just like, you know, it's just January. People are like, oh yeah, like I survived Corona. Like I, like we got through, we got through <laughs> also, 2020. Also have to do taxes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Taxman still wants his. So like that's, that's just kind of part of the business. But um, as far as the scale up, we always like to see first that you've got kind of your mindset, right? Yeah. And, and that's like pretty standard. You can go to any RIA and hear that. For us, it means something uniquely different in that you have to decide from day one, that the, stru- the foundation of your finances is in place. Not talking about, oh, I've got 30 grand cash in the bank. I've got an IRA. I'm not talking about that. I mean, like everything that I do in this business will go through this bank account and this credit card and that's it, right? Just the foundations of money management. You got to have from the very beginning, especially if you're going to do it yourself. The last thing I want to do is go through your personal checking account, see all your Netflix and your groceries and your whatever that you have going on in there. Like I don't, there are things I just don't need to know. I'll find out at some point anyway, cause I'm nosy, but like, I don't need to know all that stuff up front. Um, but that's really where you got to start. That's the first stepping stone, get the foundation laid, get that coaching up front, get a couple deals under your belt. Then once you've kind of figured out the operations, the sales and marketing, I honestly would recommend getting a little bit of coaching on the accounting side so you can continue to do it yourself but then at some point you're going to buy a deal. And the whole point of that deal is to pay for a bookkeeper. And that bookkeeper can scale with you to infinity and beyond. At that point, you never have to deal with your accounting again. But now you're savvy enough that if they're doing something weird, you can catch them in it and begin to audit them instead of just trusting them. And then you don't know if they're doing the right job or not until 12 to 18 months down the line. Like that's that's a no-no. Don't, don't do that. But that's really how that scale begins to look. So you'd, you'd advise everybody to get the, you know, uh, functional accounting expertise under their belt and then scale as fast as possible into a, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so, and, and really it, it, you're going to have to do that anyway. Like we do a lot of kind of like partnership coaching with other real estate coaches where we come in and we talk about the bookkeeping, um, because like all of these coaches know, and if, you're, if you've been in real estate for any amount of time, you know that your financial conversations aren't just happening in April before the tax deadline. It's happening every time you go to the bank to ask for a loan, every time, or try to build that relationship. Because you're not only do you have to like know what you're talking about, but you have to look professional and nothing like, it's really easy to not look professional when somebody asks you like, hey, what's your debt service coverage? What's your, what's your debt to income? And you just glaze, like you don't know what a loan to value is or like the difference between your book value and your market value. So you have, have to have that financial literacy, some of that accounting literacy in place up front. 
Uh, and then from there, you just have to understand kind of how that scales a little bit, uh, understand some of the fundamentals and like, like I mentioned, uh, CapEx and capitalizing costs versus expensing costs. Uh, and then you'll rule the world. Like before you know it, like those are the building blocks. You can get all the funding you need. And at some point you'll be able to cash flow a bookkeeper. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think that's something that translates across every aspect of a, a new entrepreneur's journey, right? And as you mentioned, you know, that goes back to the power of having a coach and, and whatnot is, you know, having that fundamental understanding of each aspect of your business and then scaling to a point to where you're, you're not trying to hold on and do everything yourself because you just can't. There's just so many moving parts in this business. You have to be able to rely on professionals like yourself. But if you don't know what you're doing or you don't know what you're looking at, uh, you could be in a big trouble uh, if you, like you said, if you don't know what to look for or the questions to ask or what to keep your eye on. So uh, that's, that's really phenomenal advice. So um, kind of making a little bit pivot then, Ben, when we get ready to engage somebody like yourself, uh, you know, a bookkeeper on whatever deal it is, at what stage should we guys, should we get you engaged in a part of our team? Sure. So um, this is an excellent question. So when we think of that, like when we think of marketing, right, every marketer should have some sort of like target market or niche market. And so like in real estate, you can say, Hey, my niche is, you know, single family homes under $50,000 in Southern Oklahoma city. Right. Uh, or it's apartment units, it's apartments between 20 and 80 units in Kansas city. Right. Like however you can get to get niche down for my company, our niche in the, in the bookkeeping space is either companies who are doing something like a quarter million dollars in revenue. Uh, that's really where we think it's feasible, where you can begin to hire a bookkeeper and you've got enough cash flow going that uh, it's easy for us to help you scale. Uh, but the other big consistent part of our niche is that you are approaching some sort of major life event. Most of our clients are either getting into or officially starting retirement, or they're getting into and officially starting having their first kid, like without fail. I had a prospect call me yesterday because his wife was due yesterday. And it was like, Hey, we can't do this anymore. Like we're going to like, we need to get our time back. And so there, is there an income component to this? Absolutely. Is there also just a time component to this? Fundamentally? Yes. And more and more, we're seeing that like, if we can show up and provide the value and help you close loans and get the financing you need and get the reporting you need and get your taxes done, like we're not the cheapest game in town by any stretch, but we're going to help you get your time back and help you leverage in other ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Time is money and in, in this space for sure. And so, no so you know, in, in whatever aspect, but it's, uh, it's definitely, I mean, that's what we're all in this to do, right? It's kind of take control of our time. And, and um, you know, again, you can't do it all yourself. So, you know, respect that by all means, but let's kind of, pit, well, before we make a pivot, what are some of the, what are some of the fees associated with having a bookkeeper like yourself? I know you mentioned that, you know, this is, there is a little bit of a cost here, but what, what can we expect when we're working with you on our, our next real estate transaction? Sure. Well, the, the good news is that I only want a million dollars and that this scales bargain. fairly well. It is a bargain. Look, <laughs> we're going to shell out it's worth every penny, um, whatever it takes to get the leverage done. No, the good news is that this scales pretty well. Um, at the end of the day, I, we think the ideal system is, and we've kind of covered this, is build the knowledge base build the system, and then put the person inside the system, right? Pretty straightforward. So if you're building the knowledge base, you're reading the books, uh, you found people to talk to, you're listening to podcasts or whatever, you know what you're doing inside your head. From there, the next thing we say is go find the software to get it done. So for us, uh, like our system is built around QuickBooks Online. Uh, if you're using QuickBooks Online to do your real estate stuff, you absolutely need the most expensive kind. And I'm very sorry about that. There is no way around it. Uh, you have to use QuickBooks and you have to use class tracking in QuickBooks to get this done right. Projects won't work. Customers won't work. I've, I've been there. I've I, like, I've sweat that out for hours. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but that's how you can begin to get started is just scale up the software side. That's the first big cost. Um, the good news is that if you begin to get that through an accounting firm uh, like us, we can help you basically negotiate those rates down. Like I pay QuickBooks $2,000 a month for all of the software and services that we have right now all in. Um, it's, a, it's, it's wild. It's something else. Um, so that begins to scale pretty easily just on the hard cost for the software and that's per entity. So don't get wild and crazy with your LLCs because that's mm -hmm. a great way to make everything more expensive. Um, but then once that happens, what you can see and what we see is pretty competitive is 
uh, that bookkeeping is probably going to cost you anywhere from 200 to 500 dollars a month just to get started, uh, and that 200 is really low, uh, and that's separate from the software costs. Uh, like, and if like, and by all means, like, feel free to call my bluff. Uh, what you can do, and what anybody listening to this can do, is they can go to QuickBooks.com. QuickBooks has launched a feature called QB Live Bookkeeping. And that's where you can give them $350 a month, depending on how big or small your business is. And there's a bookkeeper that'll be on call that you can call and ask them questions. Not do it for you, not know everything, not be an industry expert, hold them accountable, ask some questions. Maybe they can figure out some cleanup, but it is chat roulette bookkeeper style through QuickBooks Online. And that's 350 a month. Like that's that's what we're talking about here. So that's how you kind of begin to scale. Um, ultimately, your scale is always going to be software multiplied by the number of businesses you have, and then labor. And that labor again can just kind of change depending on how big your business is, what you have going on. That's the easiest way to think about cost here. Nice. Yeah, I, I love mean, the chat roulette reference. I can yeah. I can just see that going on. <laughs> well, and I've got I've got friends who do the QuickBooks Live bookkeeping, uh, and they're getting paid. Like a big part of our, our coaching program is all about like get your first paycheck, figure out what it's like to get paid as an entrepreneur because it is awesome. Doesn't matter if you're making ten dollars an hour or whatever. That first paycheck you earn, that's all you, is a good time. And so they'll go and do QuickBooks Live bookkeeping and quickly realize, hey, I could make a lot more money if I weren't going through QuickBooks for this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a good gig, but absolutely, it is. Who's on Who's on call right now that can answer this guy's question? Do you know anything about real estate? Doesn't matter. Get in there. It can't be that bad. Like, it is that bad, by the way. Real estate's complicated. <laughs> it is. It helps to have people that understand the business. That's that's for sure. So, uh, but, you know, talking to the point of cost, I mean, it's definitely, it's just definitely something that to be prudent of. But, you know, when you're looking at the, the costly mistakes you can make by either poor reporting or poor bookkeeping, as we've already kind of briefly discussed, you know, you got to weigh the pros and cons there, you know, is a, is a $500 a month, whatever, you know, expense, is that worth the thousand plus dollars that you're going to experience if you, you know, record something incorrectly, or maybe you have a profit and loss statement that's not uh, translated correctly. Um, you know, it could, I, I would, I would rather the first. <laughs> it sneaks up on you, man. So, and so there's really two places where we see this get spooky. Um, the first, the easiest way to think about this is uh, flipping houses, right? I'm not, like, I'm not sure if you guys are like, have really flipped houses before, but generally speaking, you go, you put money down, you spend a whole bunch of your money. Maybe you, you use credit cards, you use somebody else's money. You go to sell the house, you get a big check at closing. Everybody's happy, right? If you're in a situation where you get that big check at closing, like we just had a client, he got $57,000 at closing from flipping a house. He's like, cool. And he had a joint venture partner who was 50, 50 on the deal. Um, and so he takes that 57,000 and cuts that dude a check for half. We, it took us all of 10 minutes to look at his numbers and realize that he only made $23,000 on that deal. The rest of the cash that he got at closing was just equity coming back to him. So he effectively lost money on that deal by paying out his joint venture partner the wrong way because he was thinking about cash and not accounting bad, bad times, Mm. bad times. It's like, like, don't do that. Like, let's put money in your pocket. Um, Or same, like similar situation. We had a guy who was uh, closing single family homes uh, with hard money and just stacking them on. Like he had had a bunch of stuff. He's doing a lot of business today, but he didn't have the numbers in order. And so he was kind of stuck paying these, this hard money loans at 15% for over a year, like stabilized rehabs done cash flowing can't get out of the loans, can't go to the bank because he literally cannot talk the banker's language and give them the information they need in order to refinance. Oh, that's interesting. He, he was inadvertently locked out because he couldn't communicate with, uh, kind of the refinancing piece of that. Yeah. Just couldn't fulfill the underwriting requirements of the bank and was having a bad time. Like just, just kind of stuck. And so he knew how to sell, he knew how to wholesale and his salute, like he, at some point he was doing like 10 rehabs a month in his heyday. And so it's like, he's like, I'm just going to keep doing that and paying all this debt until something magically changes with my numbers and everything gets better. And the, something that magically changed with his numbers was spending a little money on a bookkeeper who could put it all in the right place. And now he still does like 10 rehabs a month. Cause he's a madman, but he's now doing it with bank money at like 6% instead of 15% hard money. Right. Uh, and all that, all that took was the phone calls is, is what you're saying. 
Oh, it took a bunch of work. Oh. Like it was for him. It, for him, it was a phone call. It was a couple phone calls, a trip to Panera Bread. But uh, but for us, it was a. We went through about a year and a half worth of data, put it all together, put some pro formas together, sent it to the bank, and said, "What else do you need?" Uh, and they said, "Thank you. Everybody made money, uh, and and he's got a stable portfolio that's ready to rock and roll." Yeah. That's cool. That's a great I, story. I, I, I thanks for sharing that one because um, that's a situation where you know. If you reversed 18 months ago or whenever that started, that would have been no problem. But then it kind of snowballed. And even though you're even though he was success, successful, he's stuck paying a high tier debt because he couldn't get uh, on the same wavelength with the with the bank on the pro forma side, right? Yeah. Are you guys familiar with uh, the book Traction at all? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, fundamentally, uh, I love traction. It's like he was a he was a visionary. And he had construction experience, so he knew the operations, and he knew how to do his marketing. But the like the core deficiency in his team was the finance side, and it ju- it was so he was able to scale. Like he was doing deals, no doubt about it. He just could not get through that hurdle, and it showed up in his business as can't get refis, have to keep wholesaling, have to keep flipping, have to keep paying payroll instead of just stabilizing his rentals and taking a nap. Right, like that's you that so you just need all of those pieces in your business we too often especially like with the rias and the coaching that we see everybody kind of skims the finance they're like oh somebody else will figure that out for you we'll take care of and that that's later. just the yeah like ask your cpa okay cool but my cpa is on vacation from june to december and i'm trying to get a loan closed in july so what do we do here like it's just a mess constantly um, yeah yeah we kind of touched base on a minute ago, but I, I was just thinking as you were going through that, uh, that last story there, I can imagine you guys probably see tornadoes of messes when these people kind of reach out to you guys. Right. I mean, probably years upon years or project upon projects of just, you know, like you said, you, we use the example of just dropping a box on your desk. It's like, here's what I got. Good luck. You know, and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I can't imagine the, the, some of the other stories that you've had or the experiences you've seen, but, um, uh, I guess it's, that's why you you guys are worth your, your, uh, that cost, you know, is cause it takes a lot to clean it up after you've done it wrong for so long, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, so what we like to do is spread out costs as much as we can, right? Like it's like everything we do is flat rate. Um, so it's predictable. And then if it's going to change, we have a conversation about it. Like, Hey, your business doubled. We're going to ask you for 30 more dollars. Is that okay? Like whatever the conversation is. Right. Um, but consistently, yeah, it's like whenever we bring somebody on and anytime we bring on a new pro- prospect or client or what have you, I tell them we're going to be best friends for the next 30 days. And that's because not only is there an absolute mess here, but I need to get inside your brain so that I can understand and document how you think and work so that I know when is the best time to ask him for his receipts and should I even ask him for bank statements or do I need to go straight to his banker and see if we can't get bank login in a way that doesn't let us buy ourselves a boat with his money, right? Mm -hmm. Like how can it's bookkeeping is very (laughs) time-based and relationship-based. You can build that relationship right up front with somebody. It, you, you can get your time back. Our goal is to have our clients spend five minutes a month on their actual bookkeeping tasks and the rest is just relationships and do a deals. That's really where we like to end up is get out. I don't want you here. I want you out running your business. Uh, we can handle all of the finance and the accounting and the minutia and the debits and credits. Like that's our skill set. Go, go do deals, right? That's what it's all about. Absolutely. I can definitely appreciate that. So, well, Ben, let's kind of pivot a little bit. I want to talk about your landlord uh, CFO system that you just launched uh, in 2020 and kind of tell us a little bit more about that and, and the CFO services that you're offering. Sure, man. So bluntly, what we like to do with bookkeeping clients when they first come into our funnel uh, and we first start really talking to them and evaluating their business is we'll give them a bookkeeping plan and it's soup to nuts. Here's how to build your finance department. And you can take this and go show it to any other accountant and bookkeeper in town and they could take it and run your accounting for you. Uh, but we're going to put it all together. We know what it looks like. We'll hand it to you. We'll say, do you want some help? That's how we, like, I'm, a, I'm not a salesman. I'm an accountant. There's not a sales bone in my body. I will give you the answer and then ask you for money. Like that's, that's how this works in the bookkeeping side. At the same time, what we found though, is that like when we'll give people the answer and then at that point we know how much we should charge them to do that service. They'll turn around and say, 
that's all of my cash flow because we're brand new or we're just getting started or in a weird place right now. Uh, or we just don't have enough deals under our belt. Like we're having this conversation a little early. We needed something in between kind of like free content, like a YouTube channel or whatever, where it's, Hey, here's how you get started. Here's your mindset. And here's how you outsource. And that's where landlord CFO really came into play. It was, it's that stepping stone of, can I give you the knowledge and information that you need? And can I give you all of our procedures on how we do stuff so that you can just scale and do it? And we've got some Q and A, some coaching involved in that program as well. Uh, and then as soon as you're like, Hey, thanks for helping me grow, but I still hate this. Can you just be my bookkeeper? We'll credit the cost of your course towards any cleanup and ongoing services for outsourcing. Like it's just, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to make money in real estate without drowning in your accounting. Well, I appreciate that. John, that, that sounds very much similar to the process of investor nurturing, right? Where you, you have people come in, they get introduced to you, your business, and you spend time educating, educating. and, and giving that value back by, you know, through education. And then eventually as that relationship builds and as that confidence build, as their fundamental understanding of the business uh, grows, then the hope is, okay, it either translates into a potential partnership in the future, or, you know, they can go on and invest with whoever else, but yeah. very, very similar philosophy Agreed. there. Right. Well, it's like, dude, I, I'm just waiting for the day that Bigger Pockets announces that they have a fund. Like, not Brandon, not anybody else. Like, Bigger Pockets is like, hey, we're doing an investment. Like, because you're exactly right. Like, the the nurturing is just key. People don't know what they don't know. As soon as they get comfortable, it's like, oh, this is a no brainer. Let's go to work. Yeah. Um, let's let's yeah. let's be all in. Well, and I, I tell you, as an entrepreneur, would when it comes to you know working with certain vendors or certain professional advisors when you're building your team you know, having that relationship with them and that um, system to where, you know, for example, bookkeeping, like you said, you're providing me education on why I need this resource or here's some things that I need to know when it comes to this avenue. Having that relationship and that dialogue, um, it, it string, like you said, it strengthens that relationship and it, and it makes me want to work with somebody like yourself, right? It, it, make, it solidifies that partnership, um, you know, because it's, it's, if it's just a phone call saying, yeah, call me when you're ready, I mean, there's just not much of that relationship there, you know, does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and it's fundamentally, yes. Like, uh, we, I spent the better part of the first 12 months of my business, just going to Ria's and talking to people. Uh, and I'm not necessarily a networker, but it was like, how can I show up and just help people understand this piece? And, and now four years later, uh, we're able to begin to see some of those rewards or people who had one or two deals three or four years ago now have 10 to 20 deals. And they're like, Hey, I need some help. Or somebody who was thinking about syndication before is now syndicating a deal every other month. And they're like, dude, this cannot continue. Like I need, I need you. Uh, I, like my LPs are so mad at me for not giving them reports. I really need help paying yeah. my prefs. Like, what can we do? Uh, and then we can jump in. And then we already have the relationship. We know how we work. They know I'm not stuffy. Uh, I'm gonna show up and you know scratch my beard the whole time. Like, like we're gonna like we're gonna have a fun time. Uh, and they know that it's gonna get done because they fundamentally know me and they know that I know what I'm doing. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, quick question. You know, speaking of that, um, for some reason this is coming back to me. But uh, we talked about the integration piece. Um, you know, a multi, across multiple platforms. What about different investor portals? Um, you know, as, as a syndication, if we have multiple LPs in the deal, you know, it's nice to have a portal that's a one-stop shop. Uh, you know, for example, Syndication Pro, Investnext, those guys. Um, does does your do you have the ability to integrate into those platforms as well and upload you know whatever bookkeeping documents into those platforms? Sure. So uh, what we actually do is uh, more gangster than that. So what we have, because here's it, like all those platforms are fantastic, but they're also very uh, expensive at yeah. first and uh, they're very careful. And it's it, like you, at the end of the day, you really got to know how to get in there and navigate and look what you're looking for. What we like to do, honestly, like when we work with syndicators, we will take all the receipts. We'll work with the property management company, get whatever they have, make sure that it's right, change what needs to get changed, put it in QuickBooks, right? From there, the reporting software that we use is called Sift Analytics. And what I really like about Sift Analytics, number one, it connects straight to QuickBooks online. So if I change something in QuickBooks and then go to Sift, the change is instantaneous. Number two, they have their own KPI dashboard that we can go in and change that always shows a comparative period. 
Mm. So what we like to do with syndicators, we say, okay, you raised money with an OM, with an offering memorandum. You took somebody, your budget, your pro forma, and you said, this is what we're going to do. So let's take your actual numbers, stick them in this dashboard, and then sync QuickBooks to your dashboard so everybody can see Here's how we did in you know January. Here's how we did in December. Here's how it changed. And are we hitting our metrics or not? And we can show the financial health of the apartment building, the business, whatever it is there in real time. So not only can your LPs see, oh, hey, we're actually hitting our income target for the first time in forever, uh, but also our utilities are out of control. What's going on there? And you as the asset manager can turn around and say, yeah, I know I'm looking at the same report you are. And I've talked to the property manager three different times. We fixed a leak. That should be done. Right. Brutal transparency. <laughs> and it's got fun colors is my favorite piece of this. Not only is it brutal transparency, but it's not a PL. It is not a spreadsheet that's black and white. It's, you know, like green checks if we're good, like red X's if we're bad, pay attention to me. Uh, like it's, dude, it's a good time. Like I, we, I re, this is my secret sauce for 2021. Like we're, and, and this yeah. is, uh, this is the analytics like back end that links into a, another investor portal or is this, so, oh yeah. So the, the good news is that like, because we are customers with SIFT analytics, like my firm pays the fee for SIFT and then we can add as many people to that platform as oh, we want. Oh, it's a come along. With yeah. You, I mean, with you anyways. Yeah. It's, it, so it is completely interactive. Like, mm. like if, if people want to talk to us, they can, but ultimately it's like, you can just log in and see the report without being able to change any of my stuff in QuickBooks, right? Like you do what you need to do please don't change my entries. I know what I'm doing. You can ask all the questions you want. Stay out of QuickBooks, play in SIFT all day. Again, put people where they need to be. Um, so like we don't train customers to use QuickBooks, not because we don't want them in there, but because they don't have the time and they don't really need to be in there if they can get into SIFT. Mm -hmm. Like that's just it all, like my whole business is based around this core competency idea. I like that. I love that. And, and I think that was uh, the point you were making earlier about, you know, uh, you know, misreporting to the LPs or, or, you know, they hadn't got their distributions yet because of whatever the issue, that's what kind of sparked that question for me is, you know, again, that's the advantage of having like in a portal, but uh, I, I love this SIFT analytics that you talked about, like you said, having that core competency um, and uh, being able to go back and see that. That's great. Um, so, well, tell us a little bit about your, your real estate portfolio, Ben, what have you, what have you been doing as a real estate investor? Um, you know, tell us about some of the projects that you're looking into or, or what you prefer to invest in and, and we'll kind of close out the show after that. Sure, man. So look again, core competencies, you don't want me swinging a hammer. Like I'm an Eagle scout. I can go figure it out, but like, that's not where you want me to be. Um, and I'm also really not like a money raiser. Like I can put on the personality, I can put on the show, but that again is not my core competency. Uh, where I really live and thrive in is the numbers. So everything that I do from a real estate perspective is in these sorts of partnerships where we'll reach out to people who are just naturally gifted at raising money. Like they're like, I've got a, we've got a guy that we're working with right now who he's closing to like 20, por like 20 house portfolios a month right now across the country. Uh, love them to pieces. Great dude. Do not ask him for details. And so instead of us going out, instead of like me going out and swinging a hammer on a Saturday, I'd much rather spend that time in my real estate investing, partnering with those guys. And instead of charging a fee for these kind of higher brow CFO services and the projections and the underwriting and all that junk, uh, we just take equity. And then we can bring the bookkeeping along with us to support us uh, and really just plug in purely into that business and really bolster it. So um, we've got a lot of the single family stuff handling right now. Uh, and then I'm, we're actually about to close on, I think on a partnership for some apartments and uh, short-term rentals as well. Um, outside of that, like I'm, so I've, I'm 28 uh, and we've actually just moved back to Oklahoma city. So I'm looking at, instead of renting my whole life and buying things like at some point we'll house hack. Uh, I've been in town for two weeks or so getting leads for that. Uh, and all the other investments we do are kind of the same sort of lifestyle hacks. Like I'm about to buy a car and put it on Turo and it'll pay its own bills. Uh, we just started a e-commerce platform that, that we've just invested capital into because we think we'll see hundred percent ROI on that this year. So like, it's, it's just cool stuff. And again, I'm not doing any of it. Like it's all about find what you're good at and provide the value and partner with people to make the deals work. Boom. Love it. Love it. 
Well, cool, Ben. Well, man, this has been a great conversation and, um, you know, we definitely appreciate the insight into the world of bookkeeping and, and CFO services. Uh, definitely something that I know I had very, very little knowledge of before, um, you know, being introduced to you and having to connect it with you. So really, really appreciate the great conversation, the great insight. And, uh, man, we definitely look forward to, to staying connected with you and, um, you know, learning more about this bookkeeping world and, uh, and keeping you on our list for sure. But before we do head out, uh, John, did you get all your accounting questions answered? I think we're going to have to schedule a consulting session. After <laughs> they never stop, man. <laughs> questions never stop. Well, you know, the, the reality is, is and to that point is this is a very foreign language for most everybody. It, it, like you said, it does take a special person to really be able to just grasp the the concept of, of these finances and whatnot and, and, and interpret them. And so for most people, I think this is probably an area that they feel most uncomfortable about is looking at these numbers. And so, um, you know, going back to somebody like yourself, you have the core competency, this is your niche, this is your expertise, having somebody like you on the team um, is so, so important. So uh, really glad that you came on the show today and, and shared that. And I hope that this, um, you know, gets people to, to inspire to reach out to people like yourself and get them engaged and, um, you know, and, um, and help grow their businesses in the right way. So, but before we wrap up, Ben, let's, uh, we got a few more questions for you, man, and then we'll, we'll close it out. So um, what are some things that you like to do for your continued education to help further your, your business, your entrepreneurship? Uh, sure. So as far as growth is concerned, uh, I've got a first uh, mastermind group, just people in the same, in the same part of their business as I am, mm -hmm. they're figuring out how do we hire employees? How do we fire that bad employee that we thought was going to be great? Um, and so we've, I've got a mastermind group that I meet with once a month where we're reading books with each other. Uh, it's a two hour call every like, every, like once a month on a Thursday. Uh, and it is high value time for me. Um, the other thing that I find really high value is getting both to uh, reach up and reach down. So uh, we do weekly coaching for these other bookkeeping businesses where it's right. uh, not only am I talking to people who are brand spanking new, trying to figure out how do I sell as an accountant, but then also spend that quality time with my original mentor. And he and I are both on this call giving kind of the same advice. And sometimes it's a little bit different and that's refreshing, but then we can work together and I can go to him. Uh, and then on the real estate side, I mean, it's the truth is that I have, not only do we have 43 clients, but I've got 43 people across the country doing different strategies where at any given moment I can get on the phone and say, Hey, I'm looking at doing a deal and I don't really understand it, but it looks a whole lot like a deal that you did recently. I know the numbers. Can you walk me through what made this a good decision for you and the sales and marketing, and the operations? Mm -hmm. uh, and just, again, just like leverage that network and providing the value. And then when you do ask people just show up for you, um, mm -hmm. that's been my, that's been my experience predominantly. So that's, that's how I really like to grow. And then a bunch of books, so many books. Awesome, man. Awesome. What have been some of the lasting lessons that you've learned along your entrepreneurship journey? Ooh, uh, lasting lessons. Um, sure. So first for anybody who feels like they're like stressed for time, right. It is really kind of where we see most people kind of quit on their entrepreneurial journey. Um, whether you're a stay at home mom or you're working two jobs already, you're trying to get into real estate. Uh, there's such a culture in, in entrepreneurship right now. That's like, very much traction, vivid vision, 12 week year. You can go do it, work as hard as you can every day, short-term sacrifice, long-term gain. That all works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I am also saying that if you grow by 1% every day, you'll be 100% better in 100 days. And that's before you get all math nerdy about it and think about like, like you know, in, gains. incremental gains, right? <laughs> yeah, like before all of that, like if you like purely atomic habits, if you just grow by 1% every day, find that 10 to 15 minutes to move the needle a little bit in a hundred days, you will be miles away from where you were originally. That's been, and that's in every part of my life right now, honestly. So I'm all about that 1% better everyday life. That's, and that's not original. That's Atomic Habits. Go read it. It's fantastic. It's good. Yeah. Work. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. Awesome, man. Well, what, what would be some advice you'd give to the listeners to help them grow their businesses? Uh, sure. D don't be afraid of networking. Everybody expects you to be weird. Um, because it's real estate and we're all weird. So like, don't be afraid of making new friends. Uh, it's a good time. Go full nerd with it. Um, but then also like do just don't forget to build your business along the way. 
Like it's so easy to get excited about something uh, and just scale and, and, and be crazy about it. But if you forget about your accounting, if you forget about your like saving money for taxes, if you forget about building these other relationships, if you forget about marketing or recruiting higher level talent, uh, you're going to hit a roadblock and it's going to hurt. Uh, so just don't, don't forget to keep building while you're growing. Great advice, man. Great advice. Appreciate that. So, all right, Ben, tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and get connected with you. Sure. So uh, you can stalk me on Facebook and LinkedIn and pretty much everywhere. Uh, we actually just started doing a whole lot more on Instagram and YouTube. You can go to Lineshare Bookkeeping or Landlord CFO on YouTube or Instagram. Uh, and we're, we're, I'm just fundamentally, it's me and my camera talking exactly this fast, uh, going over accounting <laughs> concepts and how to build the back office and really the accounting finance side to real estate investing that we feel gets skipped in a lot of the RIAs and the mentorships that happen. Um, so you can go find us there and that's a great place to find all the free information you need to build that core competency so that you can level up. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure that's in the show notes. And, uh, again, want to thank you for being here on the show with us. Thanks for tuning in. And, uh, I got to tell you, I haven't talked to too many book cover keepers, but, uh, you're a pretty cool guy, man. I got to imagine that you're probably one of the cooler ones out there in the group. So uh, he's, a music, he's a musician, right? Yeah. He's a music guy. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Accounting just pays the bills. Right. Exactly. You're talking my language right now, man. I can't wait. I cannot wait for this quarantine to shut back down uh, so that we can, uh, we can get out there and play more shows and go travel again and all that yep. stuff. Like it's going to be a good time. I hear that, man. I hear that. Well, well, Ben, thanks again for tuning in, man. Dude, thanks. my pleasure. Happy to be here. Thank you so much.